Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Beneath the Surface with Marie Mammal Care Center. Um, today, we're being joined by uh, Dr. Barbara Taylor from NOAA's uh, Southwest Fisheries Office. Um, and we're going to hear about a project that, that I've been involved with for quite some time, and Barb has been involved with for much longer than that. Um, but it's an issue that's near and dear to, to me. Um, and hopefully after tonight, um, it's an issue that you will also find engaging and want to do something uh, about as well. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Taylor. Dr. Barbara Taylor has been researching marine mammals for over 30 years. She's a senior scientist at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in La Jolla, California. For 14 years, she led a group of scientists identifying units to conserve using genetic data and has promoted developing guidelines and standards to facilitate naming new tax of cetaceans using primarily genetic data. She also specializes in estimating risk of extinction and has worked with some of the most endangered species. She has been a member of several endangered species recovery teams and has served on many status reviews of species petitioning for listing. She serves on and formally chaired the Conservation Committee of the Society for Marine Mammalogy. She serves, serves as the listing authority for Cetacean Specialist Group of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, and co-chairs the Integrated Conservation Planning for Cetaceans team. But I'm just realizing it's a good thing we didn't just say the acronyms in here or people would be lost <laughs> already. In uh, 2006, she participated in a survey that failed to find any baiji, the Chinese river dolphin. Uh, portending the first human-caused extinction of a dolphin or whale. As a result, she's actively working with other conservation scientists to prevent the extinction of what now becomes the most critically endangered cetacean, the vaquita. In 2016, she received the Society for Conservation Biology's LaRoe Award as a leader in translating the principles of conservation biology into real-world conservation. Um, it's been just an amazing journey, uh, Barb, to get a chance to meet you and to, to participate in, in some of the uh, amazing adventures that we've had as well. Um, and I look forward to your lecture. Um, lastly, but not leastly, I want to thank uh, Marathon for being able to support um, our lectures. So without further ado, uh, Barb, take it away. Thank you so much, Dave. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And I see amongst the audience that there's a bunch of people who know even more about Bakita than I do. So I don't know why they want to hear me talk, but you'll have a lot of great people to ask questions to. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, share my screen now. How does that look, Dave? Good. Okay, well, today I'm going to talk about vanishing vaquitas, lessons from a humble porpoise. And I'm going to take quite a tour around, um, starting with a little bit of marine mammal conservation history to sort of put the vaquita story in context and talk about the recipes for success that have worked in the past. Um, and then consider what vaquitas can teach us now about changing that recipe um, and take in a few lessons from terrestrial species and finally talk about opportunities to change that recipe. So when I started out as a marine mammalogist, um, it, things were quite different. Um, I graduated uh, in from high school in the same year that the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed. And things were really at a crisis stage in an environmental uh, sense. Um, and one of the chief things that was in people's view was uh, industrial whaling. And uh, you can see on the graph sort of the sequential elimination of the great whales from the world's oceans. There were over 2 million killed uh, in the Antarctic and over 200,000 that were killed um, in the North Pacific. And this was one of the things that prompted uh, both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and also a year later, the Endangered Species Act. 
Another issue that um, pushed the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, was the tuna dolphin issue, which um, many of you know about, but some of you may not know the full history of that. And it's a really a pretty amazing story. In that same year that the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, um, 368,600 dolphins were killed by the U.S. tuna fleet. I mean, that's just a, a spectacular number of animals um, to kill in one year. And there was a lot of optimism in 1972 um, that passing this legislation would um, make an instant um, impact um, to solve this problem of all of these dolphins being killed um, in tuna nets. <clears throat> but the story actually is much more complicated. And, and, it, and I think, ironically, relative to Vaquita, it was a much more tractable problem to solve. Um, there was in 1972, uh, the, the, there were some innovations, the numbers of dolphins you can see started to drop, but then the boat switched uh, from US to other flags um, and the, the dolphin number of deaths started to go up. And there was some undercover work by Sam Labuddy that resulted in some negotiations with the star kiss to, and resulted in dolphin safe uh, tuna cans which later was uh, put into legislation in the La Jolla Agreement. And, you know, all of that took over 20 years. And during that period, another 2 million dolphins uh, died in the tuna fishery. And it, it still was a good thing. I mean, it's likely that uh, millions of dolphin lives were saved, but it is a really good example of how long it really takes to change human behavior even when you know exactly what the problem is. The other thing that was very influential in a positive way in my career is, is uh, that's me in 1980. Um, and I was uh, working with the Inuit uh, north of Barrow, Alaska, out in the sea ice counting bowhead whales. And at the time, um, it was a big uh, controversy in the International Whaling Commission that the US was uh, anti-whaling, but uh, still had um, apparently uncontrolled um, whaling of an endangered species in their own waters. And the result of this um, issue um, was that the natives formed the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission um, and very successfully uh, controlled the number of animals being killed. And today, um, they're almost back to historical numbers. And most of the whales that are swimming uh, past Barrow, Alaska, which I got to see again last spring, were actually born um, since I was standing out on the ice. So a real conservation success. Well, what made these laws and rules effective? Well, there was governmental will that was fueled by public support. There were empowered implementers. There was a enforcement or at least fear of enforcement. Um, there were at least some users that were motivated uh, to sustainable use. There were data to drive the management, NGOs and courts to check implementation, a well-educated and concerned public and conservation issues that could be solved through regulatory mechanisms. And we'll see how that is not the case for many conservation issues today. So it takes sort of this sweet spot of having all of these different things come together before you uh, get the happy face of a conservation success. So the next experience I'm going to relate was not a positive experience, um, and it relates to the Chinese river dolphin or Baiji. I was on the 2006 survey where we took these two ships uh, up and down the Yangtze, covered the full habitat of Baiji four times, both visually and acoustically. Um, and we did not uh, see a single baiji and we did not hear a single whistle of a baiji. And we had to conclude that while we weren't looking, uh, this species that had been on planet Earth for over 30 million years had gone extinct. And this was a sort of a soul shattering uh, experience. 
<clears throat> and it really motivated uh, Lorenzo Rojas Bracho and many others who have worked on Vaquita to come back and try to not repeat that horror um, with Vaquita, who then became the next most endangered marine mammal. So you can see the tiny distribution as the little yellow spot of, of, of Vaquitas um, in the middle of your screen there. Um, they were only described um, in 1958. <clears throat> and uh, we believe that they have been basically restricted to that far northern area and as a result um, are what we're calling a naturally rare species. So Lorenzo and I um, did a paper back in the early 1990s um, looking at what are the most important threats to this naturally rare species. We looked at pollutants and concluded that there was no threat. In fact, they had the cleanest blubber of any marine mammal at the time. Um, we looked at inbreeding depression and concluded that it was no threat, at least yet at that time. Um, there were many calves and they uh, seemed to be naturally rare. The, the, their genetic pattern uh, fit a, a, a case that was uh, not something that had been very abundant and come down very recently. The lack of the Colorado River flow is uh, still cited as a major threat to vaquitas, um, but we didn't find any evidence, and now we have published many papers, um, not still not finding any evidence. Um, the 60 or more vaquitas that have been examined um, after they died in gillnets um, were all uh, fat, healthy animals. Um, as long as we've been seeing them, they've had many calves. Um, and of course, we believe that there are many fewer vaquita out there um, than the habitat supported in the past. Um, so there's really no reason to think that they might be food limited. And then we looked at bycatch, which is accidental death in gill nets. And it was clear that it was a threat. Um, you can see these pictures, these are early pictures um, of vaquitas um, and they uh, clearly were known to be entangled in gill nets. And the very earliest publications were concerned about this um, being uh, too much for the species to sustain. But we didn't have the data we needed to say that. Um, there's about a thousand pongas um, in the two villages that are adjacent to Vaquita habitat, El Golfo de Santa Clara and uh, San Felipe. Um, these are these small boats um, that um, take fishing nets out um, in the nearby waters. And they basically use gill nets for catching almost everything. Uh, Caterina da Grossa did a study in 1993 to 1995 in El Golfo, and she estimated that there were about 78 vaquitas that were killed annually, and sort of to her surprise, found that they were killed in all types of gill nets, from the small mesh uh, ones that are used to catch shrimp to the large mesh ones that are used to catch totoaba and sharks. So we then needed to put that in the context of uh, 78 out of how many? So we needed an abundance estimate in the full area of vaquitas. Oh, all right, where is my... So this was a, a film that was taken in 2008 by Chris Johnson. It's still the nicest footage, I think, of vaquitas. And you can see that they are not easy animals to see. Um, this is a close vaquita. Um, and typically they're in groups of two um, and they do this slow rolling behavior. They're not a very big animal. They're about my size, about five feet two and 120 pounds. Um, so they're quite a small animal. They don't splash around. And so they're um, difficult to see in the best of circumstances, but as if that weren't bad enough, um, they avoid engine noise. And so they stay out of the way of any motorized vessel, which means from a large ship or even from a small ponga, 
they typically move out of the range that you can see them, certainly with the naked eye and, and often even with binoculars. So in order for us to go out and estimate how many there are, um, we had to, to know more about how to, to cite these animals and count them. So we went out and did the first survey of the entire distribution of vaquitas in 1997. Um, and there were about 600 vaquitas. Um, we used a method called line transect with the big ship here um, that could carry these big binoculars that are called big eyes. They're 25 power binoculars. Um, and typically we don't see vaquitas that are closer than about half a mile. So you're looking half a mile out there for a dorsal fin that's about eight or nine inches tall. Um, that's a very difficult thing to do. And so you have to have perfectly calm weather to be able to do it. Um, you'll notice that there's also a lot of imprecision, that uh, confidence interval that runs from uh, 200 to 1,000. And that a lot of that comes from, um, we also had to survey the shallow water areas where the ship couldn't go. And so we had to use vessels and handheld binoculars that where it was much more difficult to see vaquitas. Uh, so that, that was, it's always been a problem telling what's going on in the shallow waters. So after the extinction of Baiji, we decided we needed to do another survey and to develop a method where we could tell what was happening to vaquitas every single year. So we needed to come up with a cheaper method. So we went out in 2008 um, and did a survey and simultaneously tested a number of acoustic devices. Um, and very conveniently, um, vaquitas are uh, sort of the hummingbirds of the sea and they find their food by echolocating. Their echolocation is about 10 times higher than bats. And because they're constantly searching for food and echolocating, it makes them really uh, good subjects to be able to use acoustics to be able to uh, tell at least trends in abundance. And so we paired up the acoustics and the visual, not only to develop this new method, but also to better characterize how many vaquitas were in the shallow water areas. And in the end, we estimated that there were about 250 vaquitas in 2008, which means we lost over 50% of the species in just over 10 years. Um, and that was during a period when most of the fishing was for shrimp and for uh, smaller fin fish. So with, with small, small mesh nets. And most of those shrimp um, were being exported uh, to the United States. So, um, and and I have to say all of this, it's just been a tremendous skilled international team of biologists that has made this happen. I'm not gonna go through everybody's names. Half of them are on this call. So <laughs> anyway, it, it's, it's certainly not all of my work. It's just a, been a tremendous experience. And so we brought in acousticians with these devices and tested them out to see which one was gonna be best suited. Um, and basically the winner was this uh, sort of uh, tube that you can see the arrow pointing at down there that's called a C-pod. Um, it's a passive acoustic detector. Um, and we designed a grid that you see in the map at the bottom. There's a little tiny red line that outlines the vaquita refuge. Um, that is about 50% of the vaquita distribution um, that was being uh, designated as a no fishing zone and fishermen were paid not to fish there. So the government of Mexico wanted to be able to detect whether that was sufficient and whether vaquitas were recovering. So we designed this uh, five-year study with 48 sea pods out there for two months every summer, which means you get about 3,000 days of data every single year, um, which is a a pretty amazing um, effort um, that we thought was going to show us an increase. Um, and instead, um, what we observed was uh, an accelerating decline in vaquitas after about 2011. 
um, that was resulting from the resumption of the totoaba fishery. So that animal that the gentleman is holding there is a totoaba. Um, the two villages there are really there um, established um, to fish totoaba. And they were driven along with the Kita uh, to uh, dangerous levels and both were put together on the Mexican endangered species list. And, uh, but the vaquitas were not doing well, but Totoaba seemed to be recovering. And we were getting consistent reports from the fishermen that they were uh, seeing a lot of Totoaba out there, adult Totoaba coming up into that far Northern Gulf to spawn. And there'd always been sort of a, an ongoing trade. The original trade was mainly with China for swim bladders that are used for medicinal purposes in China. Um, and there'd been sort of a low trickling trade, but then um, in about 2011, that increased dramatically when the black market became extremely lucrative um, and the price per kilo of uh, Totoaba swim bladder exceeded that of cocaine. So very uh, lucrative and tempting um, black market uh, operation. The government of Mexico took this very seriously. And in 2015, the president of Mexico came to San Felipe and announced a four part program to increase enforcement, ban gill nets within the range of Akita, accelerate development of alternative fishing methods and compensate fishermen not to fish. And the uh, map on the right, I think is a very um, useful map. The, the red zone is the gillnet exclusion zone. And inside of that, you can see the yellow hatched area, which is the historical distribution of vaquitas. The little dots are um, actual known vaquita detections, either acoustic or visual. And you can see that those little dots um, are overlaying, overlaying a sort of light green water. And that that greenness comes from the mud that is stirred up by tidal currents running across the muddy bottom that has been laid down historically um, by the Colorado River. And so it's a very special habitat um, that vaquitas seem to thrive in. It's uh, incredibly productive. And it's one of the reasons why the two fish fishing villages um, uh, have were founded um, and should be able to make a, a very good living off of this really productive uh, marine ecosystem. We also did another full abundance estimate in 2015, um, and we found that there were only about 60 um, paquitas remaining at that time. And the acoustic uh, data was suggesting a 34% per year uh, decline. But it wasn't all bad news. I mean, we weren't really pessimistic at that point because there seemed to be um, enforcement actions that were actually taking place. So the Bakita refuge that I said was a no fishing zone. You can see it on the radar screen. This is from 2008. I've outlined the Vaquita Refuge in orange. Um, you can see the land is bright. And then in between, there's a bunch of colorful little dots. And each one of those dots is a panga with one to 2,000 meters of net out. Um, so it wasn't that there was no um, gill net within the area that vaquitas were using. Um, a lot of it was displaced outside. So we still didn't know. Um, whether that was uh, going to help the population or not, but that's what we set up uh, the acoustic uh, monitoring to determine. <clears throat> then after the 2015 uh, presidential proclamation, um, when the fishermen were fully compensated, although there were some issues with the compensation plan, um, but you can see that at least when we were out there during shrimping season, we didn't see any fishing at all. Um, and you can see the radar screen on the lower right. 
in an outline of the Vaquita refuge, and there's just no uh, little ponga dots. The dots you see are actually a shrimp trawlers. But um, when we went back um, in Totuaba season, which is a little bit later than shrimp season, so it's from December through March and April, um, the Sea Shepherd uh, was, uh, and Museo de Ballena, a Mexican NGO, both had ships that were working collaboratively with the Mexican Navy um, to remove the illegal um, Totuaba nets. And here you can see a Totuaba net being held up. Um, and they were um, anchored to the bottom with these giant anchors that you see there. Um, and it was sort of the worst of all worlds for Vaquita. The, um, the nets were anchored to the bottom. They didn't have surface markers. So the fishermen left them down there, would just pull them up, take the fish out and drop them back down, uh, as opposed to the normal fishing practice of staying with your net and only letting it soak for six hours or so and then taking it out of there. So these, these nets were the what were driving that huge decline that we saw. Um, and uh, it was probably the efforts of those two NGOs that are the reason that there are any vaquitas at all today. They just did a really tremendous job. We used the acoustic monitoring then to continue to project what was going on with the population and it looked like there were um, half the number of vaquitas um, in 2016 that there were in 2015, so a 50% per year decline. So meanwhile, I hadn't mentioned that there was a, uh, is a vaquita recovery team um, that had uh, been advising the government of Mexico on the status of vaquitas since 1997. And as soon as the declines accelerated because of Totuaba, the recovery team had been discussing the idea that we might need to take some vaquitas into uh, human care, into some sort of protective environment until the Totuaba crisis uh, could be sorted out. And in 2016, the decision was to uh, greatly accelerate what had been a very methodical process and uh, do basically a Hail Mary to try to get as many vaquitas out of uh, harm's way as was possible. And a new group was formed that's called Vaquita uh, CPR, Conservation Protection <clears throat> and Recovery. Um, and Dave was part of that effort. Um, and it was an enormous effort. In 2017, in the field, in, in the fall, um, we had 90 participants from nine countries um, that were to find, catch, house, and care for vaquitas. So we had the um, acoustic team um, that modified their methods that were, you know, you put these acoustic recorders out for a long period of time. Now they were doing it on a daily basis. So they would put the recorders out, they would pick them up in the middle of the night, um, Armando and his team would analyze all the data and at four in the morning, I would get a call telling me the locations um, where they had uh, detected vaquitas. And then the visual team uh, went out to try to locate those vaquitas. And it, it was a really uh, an amazingly successful uh, system. We were able to get right out and on every good weather day, find vaquitas immediately. And then we called in uh, the catch team. Um, the catch team were mainly um, experienced harbor porpoise catchers um, from the North Sea, so from Denmark um, and Greenland. And they brought their specialized nets and methods um, to be able uh, to catch vaquitas. But then we knew once we caught them, we had to be able to take care of them. Um, and so we had uh, constructed uh, this uh, land facility that had these state-of-the-art um, clean, sterile pools on the inside that were basically designed in case we had to do emergency evacuations because of hurricanes or something from the sea pen. And then we had a sea pen um, that was uh, basically a tuna pen 
um, that was towed uh, all the way around the Baja Peninsula and all the way up into Vaquita land, and then was modified to be able to, um, for veterinarians to uh, be able to habituate um, vaquitas to um, not eating live fish, for example. And on top of that, we had every porpoise veterinarian in the world um, in San Felipe um, to be able to uh, give the best care possible to these animals. We didn't know how they would react to any of this. So the first um, animal was captured on October 18th. Um, it was about a six month old calf. Um, and the veterinarian said sometimes young animals habituate better than older animals and they thought they would give it a try. Um, they took this animal to both the um, land and the sea facility and it just never um, acclimated. Um, and meanwhile, our team was out still watching over where the mother was and they uh, brought the calf out and released it again. The second uh, vaquita that was captured was an adult female. And the initial assessment was very positive. She was uh, not pregnant, not lactating. She had a, a good heart rate and normal breathing. And they determined that um, she was a good candidate and moved her into the um, C pen. Um, but unfortunately, um, she after seeming to be doing okay, she all of a sudden dropped to the bottom um, and they tried an, an emergency release, um, but she died from capture myopathy. Um, and the veterinarians agreed that uh, taking vaquitas into captivity, uh, this ex situ option was uh, not no longer an option because there was no opportunity to learn uh, what better to do um, to not have these animals die of stress um, when there was uh, only 30 individuals remaining in the species. So that was a, a crushing blow for all of us. Um, and we had to, you know, try to come up with new ways um, to keep vaquitas around. Um, we continued with the um, acoustic monitoring, and there was another 50% decline um, to 2018. Um, and the recovery team requested that this, this small area that they had basically retreated to that was right next to San Felipe, they, they, we named it the Zero Tolerance Area or ZTA. Um, and we requested that that area just be guarded um, as much as possible to give these animals a chance. And then in 2018, um, we went out um, to do a, a photo ID effort to see whether um, we could keep track of individuals using that method. Um, and we uh, got this photograph that you see at the bottom, the female on the right with the tattered um, dorsal fin was the mother of the first calf that we caught. So it was the first evidence that they could have calves every year. She had a, a new calf in 2018. And that's important because it can potentially double the rate of recovery over what we thought before, which was that they could only calf every two years. And there was also some bad news. Um, there was a new administration in the government of Mexico and they um, cut off the compensation to fishers. Um, and so the gillnets um, returned um, at, for all the fisheries and set throughout uh, the Kita habitat. And in fact, we had difficult time uh, maneuvering um, and continue to have that same issue uh, because there are uh, so many gillnets um, in where the vaquitas are, are holding out. The Sea Shepherd, um, it continues to work, um, but in, in, uh, on December 31st, and I'm trying to remember whether it was 2019 or 2020, um, there was an incident where a fisherman who was basically a 
attacking them, which has been an issue for the last several years. Um, it's just the violence has really escalated. Um, swerved in front of the boat when it was going full speed and they couldn't avoid it. It collided and the fisherman was killed. And the uh, government of Mexico, the Navy, asked um, both uh, the net removal vessels, or all the new net removal vessels, to leave the area. And since then, there really has been very little uh, net removal that's been taking place. Um, we used to have updates, monthly updates, that were on the IUCN, which fortunately you've already had the acronym for, and the CSG part is the Cetacean Specialist Group. Um, and we try to post Vaquita news on there whenever it happens. Um, and we used to po post in Totoaba season monthly uh, maps of where the illegal activity was taking place. Um, but that's no longer possible uh, because the um, agreement, the memorandum of understanding with the Museo de Ballena and the Sea Shepherd requires them to surrender their information to um, the government of Mexico um, and then no one gets it. So, so we don't uh, have any information about what's going on in this season other than what people are verbally reporting. We did go out in um, October and early November uh, in this uh, in 2021, um, and we were unable to get good photographs that would would allow us to do photographic identification and mark recapture estimates. And so, we've been using a method called expert elicitation um, to come up with the number of unique vaquita that are seen in that little tiny area where we have the highest probability of seeing vaquitas, the, the ZTA. And you can see in 2019, um, there were a, about 10 to 12 um, individuals of sort of the peak probability. And in 2021, um, it was a, a equal chances of that there were about seven or eight. Um, but there's lots of uncertainty about that. Um, and in both years, we saw calves, so that's a good thing. Um, and we're just about to submit a paper, so you get the peak, the peak uh, preview um, that actually looks at um, whether vaquitas are doing better than expected. So we did a model that that looked at the the numbers that were estimated in 2018, which was the last year that we could do full acoustic monitoring because the, the C pods unfortunately are getting stolen. And we had the rate of change distribution. And so we were able to project that forward. And those are the, the black and gray symbols that you see. Um, and then we could compare that to what we observed, which is a minimum number, um, in the zero tolerance area. And you can see that the number of observed is much greater than we would expect if that 50% per year decline had continued. Um, so, so this is good news. Um, we don't really understand why it is. Um, my, my personal pet uh, theory is that, you know, these animals that are surviving, um, are surviving for a reason. Um, we've lost 99% of the vaquitas. Maybe the 1% that are left um, have been tangled in nets and are being especially careful. And we certainly observed in 2017 that vaquitas knew where net, nets were and they knew how to avoid them. And sometimes when they hit the nets, they got out of the nets. Um, and those tattered dorsal fins um, are also consistent with animals that may have been entangled and gotten and gotten out. We also observed, um, again, really high levels of fishing. Um, uh, each one of those symbols is for pongas with gill nets out. Um, there's uh, not supposed to be any fishing at all inside the zero tolerance area, which is that little rectangle that's uh, got the points A, B, C, D. 
um, and there were, um, when this was done, 117 pongas inside and 43 outside, all using uh, gill nets illegally. So uh, a very sad scene. <clears throat> and the other thing, um, if I can get this movie to run here, um, this is right in downtown San Felipe. Um, and this is the, basically the traffic jam of uh, uh, pongas going and stand and see like right into the boats and you can see all the gill net gear. And what you don't see is you don't see um, anyone checking paperwork. There's no Navy there. There's no um, fisheries agency people there. Um, it's, it's basically a, a free for all in terms of, of fishing, which was uh, definitely a, a change for the worse in the past few years. So the lessons from our humble purpose. Well, the greatest threat to marine mammals all over the world is accidental death in gill nets. And we certainly have learned that changing human behavior takes a long time, and it's longer than many uh, coastal and river marine mammals have before extinction. And if we're able to successfully save species by taking them into human care, we have to start much earlier to fill knowledge gaps. Um, you can't wait until you're down to the last few tens of animals. You need to learn what you need to know about how the animals react to handling when there are hundreds of animals. So we know that the recipe for success really has to change from what it has been in the past. So a group of us um, got together uh, shortly after the tragedy with uh, the Bakita CPR uh, in Nuremberg, Germany to discuss uh, some other options, more sort of aggressive conservation um, that we had to start thinking about for uh, small cetaceans. And here you can see a, a whole uh, wheel, a clock ticking um, of, of cetaceans that are in similar situations to the vaquita. They just uh, aren't quite as far along. And it was a group of about half veterinarians and half uh, biologists who worked with those species. And we're still working together um, under the IUCN um, and have a group that's called Integrated Conservation Planning for Cetaceans um, that is, is working to fill a lot of these uh, critical knowledge gaps. Let me spend a minute talking about ex situ conservation because a lot of people think it means taking animals into aquariums. Um, and it uh, definitely does not mean that. The IUCN defines it as individuals that are maintained in artificial conditions under different selection pressure than those in natural conditions in natural habitats. And the potential roles are insurance populations, temporary rescues, long-term maintenance, and as a source for uh, population restoration. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take a minute and talk about uh, uh, terrestrial species that have been saved using um, ex situ conservation that I, I think we can learn a lot of, of lessons from. Here, for example, you see a condor. Um, ironically, that highest peak uh, that you see in the mountains there is San Martir. It's right behind uh, Vaquita habitat, and it's one of the successful places where uh, condors, California condors, who would be extinct, without ex situ conservation have been released into the wild. There's a really nice book by Jane Goodall called Hope for the Animals. Um, and she documents uh, many cases of animals um, that have been uh, saved. And this particular list that I've compiled here um, are uh, animals that went completely extinct in the wild. Um, and have been reintroduced back into the wild after a period of uh, being held in various types of ex situ uh, situations. Condors amongst them, you can see the lowest number um, of condors was eight. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit more about Pierre David's deer because um, you'll see them, but note that the lowest at the lowest point, there were 10 of them and they were in some uh, private reserve in Great Britain. Um, this is a, a Chinese uh, species. 
The only example we have of ex situ conservation for cetaceans um, is with Yangtze finless porpoise, which we did see in our 2006 uh, Yangtze survey. Um, and in 1990, um, they started to move some of the porpoises um, from the river into these oxbow lakes. And it was basically so they could learn how to take care of animals in the oxbows before they brought in the much more rare baiji. Um, and that's Wang Ding, who has been uh, fundamental in this whole uh, effort. So the Yangtze finless porpoise um, sadly is following the same trajectory as Baiji. Um, you can see the 2006, um, they had greatly declined um, from the 1991 survey. Um, they are in the river and then some adjacent lakes that you can basically swim in and out of the rivers and the lakes. They were doing a bit better in the lakes than the rivers and still are. Um, and then you can see um, they declined even further and went on to the critical and critically endangered uh, list uh, to join vaquitas. But meanwhile, um, they were working very hard um, developing these Oxbow Lake uh, insurance populations. So uh, a number of people from the ICPC uh, went to Wuhan, China in 2019, um, along with COVID evidently, um, and uh, learned from our Chinese colleagues what they had been doing and got to go out and witness um, these uh, Oxbow Lakes. This uh, is Tianizhu. It's a uh, a lake that's uh, about 20 miles long and a couple of miles wide. And the pens that you see here are only for emergency veterinary care. Um, but most of the animals live just like the animals in the rivers do. They, they swim around, they eat fish, they breed and make babies. I mean, they aren't really doing anything different than they would be in the rivers, except they're completely protected. <clears throat> And the river um, is uh, having a very strong uh, conservation program um, because the uh, president of China said that the Yangtze was the mother river of China and that she was sick and that she had to be made well. Um, the fellow with the giant camera there is the minister of the environment. Um, he came to see um, the Yangtze finless porpoise, which he of course did see, but also uh, on the shores, we saw Pierre David's deer, a herd of about 200 of them um, that have uh, grown up from being uh, released back into the wild. So a very encouraging thing to see them both doing so well there. This is the Yangtze River as I saw it in 2006. And this is the Yangtze River as I saw it in 2019. And those are swans uh, flying over Tianizhu, which means Swan uh, Lake. The um, boats that you see anchored there are fishing boats. Um, they're there for their last few days. Um, and New Year's of 2020, um, all uh, fishing except recreational hook and line fishing on the Yangtze um, was banned. So the lessons from the Yangtze porpoise are that fisheries issues can be solved or reduced with strong governmental will and strong governance. Um, and that semi-natural reserves can provide insurance populations. But again, success took about 20 years. So the recipe needs some very uh, great augmentation over the earlier simple recipe. Users must include all stakeholders that may be affected by conservation actions. Implementers include enforcement, but also parties facilitating economic and social changes. Scientists include not only animal specialists, but social scientists. And courts uh, include establishing functional system of justice, which uh, is key and not present in the range of many animals uh, that are uh, endangered. And all of these take time. Um, so we need more tools that can give us that critical needed time. So what can be done for vaquitas now? 
Well, I still believe very strongly that vaquitas could recover if we stopped killing them. Um, some of the folks on the on the call tonight um, actually are, just got a paper accepted in science um, looking at the full genome of vaquita um, and uh, 20 different vaquitas, some from the 1980s, whose uh, genetic makeup looks like the ones that we got in 2017. So they had very low genetic diversity throughout this whole period. Um, and the simulations that they did um, indicate that this gives them a strong chance of recovery if you stop killing them, um, as compared to some simulations where they had larger populations that had more genetic variability. And when they were taken down to 10 individuals um, suffered from inbreeding depression and had a lower chance of recovery. So uh, that's, I think, very good news for Vaquita. Um, we also have uh, some great examples of recovery of wild populations from low numbers. Um, we have harbor porpoise in San Francisco Bay, Morro Bay, Puget Sound, and Hood Canal that are all coming back um, uh, doing gangbusters um, when they had, in some of those areas, been absent for decades. Um, and of course, we have the great example of northern elephant seals, which went down to no one knows, but roughly 30-ish individuals on uh, Isla Guadalupe uh, off of Mexico. And now there's well over 300,000 of them um, and they have uh, reoccupied the, for the, their former areas um, along the California coast. We need to really still strongly support net removal and guarding the zero tolerance area. Um, and funding is desperately needed to, to do that. Uh, Mexico still needs pressure uh, to take actions to guard the ZTA and uh, to uh, support alternative gear training and use. And it's something that I really want to emphasize is that the fishermen are trying to make a living. They're just trying to make a living. And uh, the only option that they're being given right now is to be illegal fishermen using gill nets. Um, and the recovery team has been saying for decades that there need to be alternative gears um, and training so that fishermen can use those gears and not kill the kitas. And the gears are available, um, but there's, they've never been implemented properly and socialized um, with the fishermen. And then um, there are a number of uh, possible pressure points um, that are sort of in play right now. Um, and we can talk about them more maybe in the question and, and answer uh, period. Um, but there are, um, <clears throat> actually I can't see the bottom of my slide, but um, there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, shrimp embargo, um, which could have some impact, but um, apparently are, uh, are leaking into the US and being sold. Um, it's, it seems the, the mechanisms to control shrimp trade are not uh, very good. Um, there's CITES, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. Um, they just had a meeting a few days ago and much to my disappointment decided that they needed to come take another look and see what Mexico was doing. Um, and then uh, that area is a World Heritage Natural Site. Um, and uh, it, that also is something that's in review. They put it on the in danger list um, and uh, are developing some indicators that Mexico must meet before it can, can come off uh, the in danger list. <clears throat> so I'm gonna end with a, a little bit broader perspective um, because I think vaquitas are teaching us lessons about cetaceans all over the world, small cetaceans. Small cetaceans that live in rivers and coastal areas where their entire distribution overlaps with where humans are making a living fishing. Um, and how can Americans help stop extinctions of small cetaceans? Well, I think it really would be important if we could all be good consumers. 
to question whether seafood has been caught with gill nets and to be supportive, even with our pocketbooks of sustainable fishing. Um, we have really cheap seafood. Americans are an enormous international seafood consumers um, and we're not paying the true cost of, uh, of those seafood products that are, are going onto our dinner plates. And until we do, um, there are going to be species that are inadvertently being lost um, because of our, our activities. And ultimately, I'll leave you with this, humans need to embrace living sustainably on our planet. And I think we're just seeing so much evidence now with this sixth wave of extinction that we're not doing that, um, that we really need to think very carefully about how we lead our lives um, so that we can protect these innocent species from extinction. Well, with that rosy note, I'll, I'll leave it open to questions. Thank you so much, Barb. Um... Uh, for your lecture. I know that... Um, I can't hear you, Dave. You can't. Um, can everyone else hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barb, try the thing you did to unmute uh, before. Otherwise, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I still can't hear you. I, I can try putting on headphones and see if I hear you. Um, okay, well, while we're figuring that out, um, a couple of things uh, I put into the, the chat, if anybody's interested in this fabulous t-shirt um, and others like it, we have um, a company that I've worked with called the 310 Clothing Company, and they'll donate uh, a portion of the proceeds for um, any, any purchases on that site to Vikita CPR, which is a still functioning uh, website that uh, is managed by the National Marine Mammal Foundation. Um, so if you're, you're interested in taking some action after today's lecture and you wanna do something to support Vaquita conservation, that, that is at least one thing you can do um, and also help to spread the word. So by you know, advertising, you know, if you're gonna wear a t-shirt um, and it's gonna advertise something, why not advertise something that is uh, a, a conservation that, that might be um, core to your own ideas and beliefs, right? Um, rather than, you know, whatever logo brand you want to put on there. Um, so can you hear us now, uh, Dr. Taylor? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, we had a question earlier on, and, and I know we have a few experts who might help us to answer this question uh, about specifically about the acoustic detections and how we translate acoustic detections to population numbers. Well, I, I can try to answer that. And then uh, if Armando's still on, he can, he can jump in. But what we did in the, 20, in the 2000 and, well, in the two surveys is we had the visual area overlap with an acoustic area so that we knew the numbers of uh, vaquitas in that area. And then we knew basically how many clicks that corresponded to and then they could use that to estimate in the outer areas um, but the the real important key part of the acoustic um, was using it for trends in abundance so sort of in a nutshell um, if if you you know hear 10,000 vaquita clicks in one year and you hear 5,000 vaquita clicks in the next year, you're basically assuming that there's half the number of vaquitas out there making those clicks. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward assumption that they're always needing to find food and that they're always gonna be clicking at the same rate. And so you can use that. If you, if you have a, a, a good abundance estimate, then you can use that to project into the future using acoustics as trends. So it's a it's an echo it's an echolocation click, not like a signature whistle. I think people might be familiar with from dolphins. Right. Um, okay, we have another question here, and um, let's see: is it is it possible that some of the vaquita may have migrated out of the area um, where 
you know, we've been observing them the most so that they are in a space where they're not being observed. I wish, I, I, unfortunately, we, we don't have any, they're not really migratory. Um, we basically see them in the same place all year, although there are some seasons we know better than other seasons. Um, but we haven't been able to um, monitor some areas of their historical distribution. So I, I hope that there are vaquitas that are closer to, let's say, El Golfo to Santa Clara. I mean, we, we've never been able to monitor that area well. And it is one of the areas where a lot of vaquitas were killed in those early studies that estimated the number of vaquitas killed. Um, but unfortunately, that it's in a shallow water area. And when we put acoustic detectors up there, they were all stolen. So, you know, we, we can hope they're up there, but we just don't really have any way of knowing that. Yeah, and regardless, uh, we know their population is low. Um, even if there are a few that, that may be avoiding detection right now, um, probably not enough to, to give us hope that there's some broader population someplace else. Um, okay. Um, that was, uh, I think, all of the questions that we have. Um, I want to, uh, unless there are any more questions, I just want to thank, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Taylor, for, for joining us tonight. And to let everybody know that um, we have another member of, of ICPC that will be joining us um, for uh, a lecture uh, on the 17th, Frank Cipriano, who I think is on this uh, Zoom as well, was going to talk to us a little bit about um, some really cool uh, forensic techniques that are being used in, in conservation now. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully you will be able to join us on that lecture as well on the 17th. Um, so, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight, and we look forward to seeing everybody again on our next Beneath the Surface lecture. Thank you. Bye, everybody.